Welcome to HEC TV's live interactive program that's part of St. Louis. The whole production is pulled together. It's going to be a steel bridge. The way the cockpit is designed. The highest rated green building in the world. Welcome to HEC TV Live. You see a fire truck behind us because today our program is all about fighting fires. We're being joined by Gary Graff, who's the battalion chief out here in Pacific. He's going to take us on a tour of the fire truck, talk a little bit about fire training that firefighters go through. You're going to have the chance also to uh, watch me suit up in firefighting gear and have that compared to someone who actually does it on a daily or fairly frequent basis. And then we're also going to see an example of a, of a firefighting exercise that they do uh, to practice working in a smoke-filled environment. So all of that's going to ha be happening over the course of the next hour. With our interactive programs, as always, we welcome your questions. So if you're watching via the internet or you're watching on television, email us to live at hectv.org. That's live at hectv.org. And I also look forward to our questions from our interactive video conference schools that are joining us from various parts of the country today. Don't forget, it's live at hectv.org for your email questions. Well, Gary, thanks so much for being here. It's our pleasure. In case you're watching from a much warmer location in the world than it is currently in Pacific, Missouri, we're about 12 to 15 degrees here, uh, but I, I'd say the garage is at least 18, as opposed to the outside, 12. So let's talk first and foremost, Gary, about how you got involved in firefighting. Uh, actually, uh, the third generation, um, it was kind of a family history. Uh, my grandfather and my father were both, uh, actually start, were volunteers for Pacific. Um, at one time, my grandfather was actually the chief of the department. Um, and so it was just after I was old enough to actually join the department as a volunteer, uh, I started doing it kind of as a hobby when I was in high school, and uh, I've been enjoy the job ever since. Now you're a but, battalion chief. Yes, sir. So talk a little bit about to, for everybody about the organization. Is it like a paramilitary unit? Yes, the paramilitary uh, starts with the chief of the organization. He is the head of the organization, and from there the chief has certain deputies. Um, they fulfill different roles as far as assisting the chief in administrative activities. Um, so like building inspections and fire marshals and things of that nature. Uh, the battalion chiefs are actually in charge of overall shifts. Um, and then under them are the captains. The captains are responsible for each engine house as far as their trucks, mm -hmm. their stations, and then the firefighters at that engine house. Now in Pacific, how many different firehouses do you have? Three. And, it, and you employ how many people in the firefighting capacity? Um, there's three people on duty at each, at each station at each time. We're going to have a chance to look at this truck in much more detail in a bit, but are all the trucks the same or do you have different trucks throughout the fire department? There's different trucks. Different trucks do different jobs. Uh, this one here is what we call a rescue pumper. It's a pumper for fighting fire, but then it also carries rescue tools for vehicle accidents, carries equipment for rope rescue, confined space rescue, uh, supplies for medical emergencies, um, but then we also have a ladder truck for some of our larger commercial buildings. And we have some areas that do not have hydrants, so we also have a tanker, which it carries 3,000 gallons of water. Oh. So when we don't have hydrants, we have to bring our own water. So it's a bigger truck, carries a lot more water. So each truck is designed for a specific job. We had gotten an email question actually about what you do if, you don't, if you're not near, located where a water hydrant is. Mm -hmm. So you, you just, that truck goes, go, goes out. You're talking about like at a farm or someplace like that or just yes. a rural area? We have to have trucks that come in and what we call, like I said, what we call tankers. They bring in water, uh, they'll actually shuttle water to the fire. So depending upon the size of the fire, we might need more trucks to assist with shuttling the water. Okay. Hi to our interactive video conference schools that are joining us. I understand that you guys have made it into the bridge, and I want to just go out to you guys so you can say hi. Is this Hector Garcia Middle School? Let's go to Hector Garcia in Dallas. Are you guys there? Come in and say hello. Say hello, guys. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. We are looking forward to your questions throughout the program. Let's talk a little bit about our location because those people down in Dallas may not realize that we're very near Six Flags, which is a major amusement park in mm -hmm. the St. Louis region. And obviously they've got big roller coasters and all those kinds of rides. Since it's right here by Eureka and Pacific, do you guys do specific training with them as well? Yes. Uh, Six Flags and also uh, walkthroughs because there are certain areas within the park where you can't take the bigger trucks and there are certain trucks that have to be into those locations. So constant training, pre-planning. Uh, not just there with any commercial buildings, anything with chemicals, even all the way down to pre-planning different responses on interstate highways just oh because gosh. of limited access. So it's more, we try to take a training approach so that we're well prepared to handle those emergencies, but also a proactive, preventive step so that if we do get an emergency there, 
our people are prepared for it in that location. Well, let's start talking about training. We had the opportunity to come out earlier than the program to do some various tapings and different training exercises that they go through. And there's actually, what, six fire districts, six fire departments yes. that train at this facility? Yes. You guys and Fenton and who else? Eureka, uh, Valley Park, High Ridge, and Cedar Hill. And part of what the training is, as we see this video now, is you guys practicing rescuing people from buildings. Yes. So you actually have a building out here that's what, three stories high? How tall is it um, Two stories? The big portion is two stories with an attic area, and then adjacent to that, there's a tower. The tower is five stories. And your goal is to be able to practice, like, in a smoke-filled environment, the ladder goes up against the building, the guys are actually trying to get a body, a dummy, mm -hmm. who represents a real person, out the building and down the ladder. Yeah, anytime we do any type of training, we want to try to make it as realistic to what they're going to encounter into the field as we can, uh, using live smoke, fire, um, limited visibility. Uh, the mannequins, we do that in place of having to put a real person onto the ladder. And then our biggest thing is anytime we do a training like this is make sure we maintain the safety of not only our victims, but also of our firefighters. So safety is the number one thing, key component as far as putting on any training. Now, do you have different mannequins of different sizes? So they practice like with child as opposed to adult? Yes, we have an, an adult that weighs uh, 175 pounds. Uh, then we have all the way down to basically an infant doll, which weighs 10 pounds. Okay. So it's something that, you know, it takes two or three people to carry out or take one and they're not gonna know that going into it. That's, it's dependent upon what they find during their training scenario. Now we've got some second video which shows fire, and we, you guys can actually go inside the building and can we have fire above our heads? Can we have, is the room heated up to a certain temperature so we have a sense of what that's like in our fire gear? Uh, yes, we, we elevate the temperature so you can get used to it. Uh, a lot of fire behavior as far as like we were talking about rolling across the ceiling, so you can see the changing conditions. Uh, the biggest difference, what we train with and what we encounter in the training tower that we don't have the temperature of all the products in the room that are burning. Mm. Uh, in your house or office or business, you'll have furniture, you have belongings, material that are inside of that room. In the tower, we can only burn what they call class A combustibles. Okay. Uh, wood, uh, straw, things of that nature. So it is not quite as hot in the training tower as it might be in a real fire. And that's just based upon the materials that we're using for the, sim the simulation of the training. And you also do training with the actual hoses, right? Yes. So like, and that's like, you practice connecting the hose and then and actually running the water into the building? Yes. We try to make everything as realistic as possible what they might encounter. So if, we, if it would be a fire situation where you'd pull a, whole, pull a hose off of the truck, then we'd actually do that during the training exercise. Let's go to some student questions, then we'll come back to a couple of other examples of training exercises. Hector Garcia, do you guys have a question right now for Mr. Graff? Go right ahead. When you order the fire truck, yeah. how long does it oh, take? Oh, that's an excellent question because uh, we've actually, we're going to talk about the ordering and the buying process for a fire truck. So their question is, how long does it take to get a fire truck when you order one? Uh, average, it's five to six months once it's ordered. Um, the one thing that's unique about a fire truck is it's not like buying a car. Whereas a car, you can go to a, a car lot, pick out a car and say, that's the car I'm looking for, or that's the car I want to get, and you test drive it. On a fire truck, you come up with, like for example, this truck's a, a pumper, rescue pumper. We want to we want to purchase a rescue pumper. Then you have basically a blueprint drawn up for the truck, the same as you would for a house. Um, they send this print back, and then you go through it and you proof it, and you design everything from the ground up on the truck, and it's built exactly how your organization wants it built. Now, how much does a fire truck like this cost? Um, your pumpers average between four hundred and five hundred thousand. Uh, aerials between 750, 750,000 to a million dollars. And an aerial is the one with the ladder? It's one with the ladder. Uh, the biggest difference in price is some of them have the big buckets on the front of them. Uh -huh. Those are higher priced than just a straight ladder. And is um, the fluorescent yellow the de jour color now, or do I get red fire trucks anymore, or you could can, you choose to get an orange one if you wanted to? You can get them in any color that you want. Oh. Um, this has just kind of been our department history has had uh -huh. this color for ever since we've been a, a fire district, and that's what we've stuck with. Some have the red and the yellow, but you, they'll make them any color that you want them. Oh, very cool. We're going to come back to you in a minute, Hector Garcia, for another question. We, you also do, do training, and we've got some video of this, of, of you guys doing forcible entry, going mm -hmm. through doors, because obviously you've got to do that in all sorts of environments, right? Yes. You you, so you work with like commercial building doors as well as home doors? Uh, yeah, residential, even roll up, like your garage doors, which are more uh, cumbersome to force. Any type of opening in a building, we want to make sure that we can get into that opening. 
So we train with it constantly, that way our guys are familiar with it. And we want to go in with as minimal damage. So we constantly train on the techniques of what it would take to get the door open, cause minimal damage to the property so that we can secure it also whenever we leave. So you're not necessarily working on the idea of a battering ram going through the no. door, you're working much more where the, the lock is and the knob is. Yes, with the lock and it's based upon the type of door, the size of the door, and then also the, the type of the lock. And another training that you do out here deals with cutting roofs? Yes. What that does is what we call ventilation training. Um, smoke, heat, everything that builds up whenever a building's on fire, we want to get all of that out of the building. So if we send a crew onto the roof with saws, they can open up the building, open up the roof, let all that smoke and heat out, and then we can send the firefighters in safer, to have better visibility, less heat, to get to the fire and extinguish it. Wow. Let's go Hector Garcia to you guys again for a question. Another one for Mr. Graff? How do you drive the car? <laughs> How do you drive the car? How do you drive the fire truck? Oh, well, let's, well, let's just go ahead and start the tour because that's what everybody's excited okay, about. And what great. the heck, we'll start inside and then we'll go outside so we can deal specifically with your question. So I'm going to go inside the fire truck and hopefully not hit our cameraman with the door and make sure I don't step on something I'm not supposed to. And as the camera guy comes around, you will be able to see this. And, and I'm, I'm going to operate it. It operates just like a regular big truck or car, right, Gary? I mean, I'm just going to drive it like anything else? Yes, it's, it drives just like a car. Even with the size of it, you'd be surprised how well they handle. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not like driving a, uh, you would think, a big, cumbersome a log truck. Is something so it has like a nice to... turning radius. It turns yes. on a dime. Is that what you're telling yes, me? Yes, they, they turn extremely well. They drive nice. Um, and like you said, they're, they're similar to a car. They have all the same gauges, your fuel gauges, speedometer, um, even whenever you, where you put it in drive, which mm -hmm. is down here on the side. I see that. I see reverse, neutral, and drive. It's all just like I press the button and it goes? Yes. And all you, you release the brake, which okay. is air, air braking, uh, and then you're ready to go. Now, uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about what I see here as a control panel. I see there's headlights, dimmers, wipers, etc. If if we wanted to turn on the lights that are with the truck, what do I do to make that happen? The first button up top. Emergency master? Yes. Push, and I would just push, push it? up. Oh. And now, now we have a disco light show, so to speak, for the um, garage going. And, and as we, if it's possible, all the sorts of things that I'll, I'll move out so you can come in, Ryan, because I can continue the conversation. So you can show the entire interior of that. And Gary, stay right there. What are we looking at when we look back here at the inside? What are the various stuff? What's all that stuff we're seeing? In the back, that's where the uh, the firefighters sit. Up in the front is the drivers, what you call the engineer, then the captain, and the firefighters sit in the back. In the back, they have their by each of the seats, they have their air pack, which is ready to put on, uh, flashlights, tools, so they can grab their tools as they come off. In the back of this truck, the big door in the back is actually a compartment where we keep our medical supplies. So if you're having a medical emergency, it's where a heart monitor and all that equipment is kept at inside of the truck. Okay. Um, also by each seat, you notice there's headphones. That way the crew can talk to each other as you're going down the road to the emergency and you're not interfered by the, uh, oh. the sound of the siren, the, the noise of the truck. You can communicate very well, as well as communicating to our dispatch center. Okay, Hector Garcia, we're gonna to begin to tour outside the fire truck too, but while our camera person gets repositioned and Gary and I do, do you guys, um, do you guys have another question you want to ask right now? Are you also paramedics? Are, oh, Gary, the question was, are you also paramedics or would those be different folks? Uh, no, uh, actually, um, mo especially in the uh, greater St. Louis metropolitan area, uh, most of the departments are cross-trained, whether okay. firefighter, paramedics. Um, we do not house an ambulance, but there's a lot of districts around us where the fire district actually houses also the ambulance district. Okay, and as we go down along the side here, we come to the location, which this is where the hoses connect, and I see hose right here. Yes, uh, hoses connect to the side. The ones that are packed on the truck like this, they're actually pre-connected to the truck. So as we pull them off, we don't have to hook them up anywhere else. They're already connected up here. Mm -hmm. All we have to do is pull a lever, and we have water to the, to the uh, hose line. And there's actually a water tank in the truck. Yes, this truck has, it carries 1,000 gallons of water on there, and it also carries foam for like flammable liquids fires. And the difference between them is like, um, this, this, this is for a smaller hose than this one? Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, like this one here is for where water comes out of the truck. This one here is where water goes into the truck. Okay, so this is, kind of, this is like my fire hydrant connects to this. To that one. Okay, and then what I'm gonna use to spray on the fire comes out of over here. Small ones go to the fire. 
and Correct. I've got pressure gauges. Mm -hmm. And ideally speaking, what's the pressure you're usually working with? The pressure at the nozzle of the line is 100 pounds or 100 PSI. Okay. That's what is actually coming out of the tip of the nozzle. And that's pounds per square inch, right? PSI, Correct. pounds per square inch. And as we go further back here, I see all sorts of cool levers and, and lights. <laughs> what have I got going here? These are the different ways that we get water into and out of the truck. Each one okay. of these lever control a valve, just like your faucet. You turn the faucet to make the water come out, this is the same way. I have to pull a valve to make the water come out, also to put the water back into the truck. Okay. Hector Garcia, do you guys have another question as we continue to go around the truck? Um, what happens if you get a flat? <laughs> oh. Well, let's talk a little bit about the tires. That's a great question, because the question was about, the, about getting flats. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm about five feet, nine inches tall. This is, how was this, three feet? Uh, or more, four about feet? About four. And so, big tires, and do you, do you ever get flats? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, they're just like any other parts of a working part of an automobile. At times, there, there could be a failure with them. Uh, we actually keep spares on hand at our engine house, so they, they can put a spare on, uh, put the truck right back in service. Okay, and what am I seeing here with like these, these, these different containers that would come out? Uh, some of them are, each compartment has things that are job specific. Uh -huh. For example, this compartment, there's a couple different things. Um, and the lower side here is what we call a plug kit um, and absorbent for materials for dealing with hazardous materials. Uh, the top is a toolbox, an extra thing, a utility rope and a broom. And then up here is a box that we use for chimney fires. Um, and this silver box with the knobs down here on the bottom, that's actually what we use to fill our air packs up with. Oh, okay. So the air tank that I'm going to put on in a bit actually gets air from this? Yes. We have big tanks up on the top uh -huh. and they're piped down through here and we hook it up to that tank so we can fill oh, them back up okay. while we're still on the call. And here I'm seeing saws. This is what you'd be looking using to get into a roof, that kind of thing? Yes. As you were seeing in the video earlier when doing ventilation, these were the type of saws that we were using. Uh, chainsaw, and then the other one is a, uh, like a, a chop saw that has a multi-purpose blade on it so we can get into steel doors, wood roofs, whatever we need to. Then also fans and then extra gas for any of the equipment that we carry. And is that a generator that you're using? Um, no, it's a, large, it's a fan oh, okay. so that we can actually set it up and force some of the smoke out of a building. Now when you bring the fire truck back in, you're actually able to plug it in, right? And Yes. And, and, and what, get its battery going again? They, they stay plugged in all the time, that way all the equipment on them can charge. Uh, there's flashlights, there's radios, our thermal imaging cameras, all that stuff has to charge. So that way everything on the truck can charge and it also keeps the, uh, the motor on the truck, keeps the block heater warm so that whenever we get it and go, the motor's already warmed up and it does less wear and tear on the motor. It's easier on the truck. Okay, let's go around to the back and students will be able to see the back of the truck. And obviously, do we actually have firefighters who ride on the back anymore? No. Are you all riding inside now? Everybody has to ride into the cab. Okay. Uh, with this as far, there's, so you can get up top to, to repack hose. Uh -huh. Plus we keep some equipment stored up top. So we have a ladder so we can access the top of the truck uh, real easily. Um, also on this truck are ladders. They're stored in the, in the compartment here. Okay, going up to I the open center that up and the ladder comes out. So uh -huh. that's one thing, a lot of fire trucks, you see the ladders on the side. Mm -hmm. uh, here they're into the truck, that way it's more protection for the ladders. They're not catching all the road grime and everything as we go down the road. We want to go around to the other side, but we're going to go back this way to make that happen. And as we, as, as we go back around the other side, uh, Hector Garcia, do you guys have another question for Mr. Graff? What about washing the truck? Oh, washing the truck. So it doesn't go through a regular car wash, I'm assuming. No, it, uh, like on a day like today where it's really, really cold outside, I would try not to wash it as much because as soon as you wash it, if you have to go back outside, the doors will freeze up on it, the compartments will freeze up. Uh, but we try to keep it as clean as possible. Um, and that's part of what makes a fire truck last so long. Uh, average life of a fire truck is anywhere from 10 to 20 years, depending upon how much it's run, where it's stationed at and how much it actually runs. So to get 20 years out of a fire mm -hmm. truck, you have to take really good care mm -hmm. of one. So it does get washed quite frequently with the exception whenever it gets this cold. Then it's just kind of as an ad needed basis until it gets a little bit warmer. Well, I mean, it's really cold today and it's been even colder. Talk a little bit about how that complicates the world of a firefighter. Uh, the biggest thing is we got to watch out for ice, slips, falls, um, also getting extra people to, to the calls. Um, if we have a fire, we call for an ambulance, we can get people in out of the cold, warm them up, mm -hmm. rehab them, and then we can send them back to finish okay. up whatever we need there on the fire. Now further down, I'm seeing more tools and all sorts of packs of things. My gosh, what have we got going here, Gary? Um, we'll start back here in the all back. Right. Uh, in this compartment here, we carry our rescue tool, 
uh, commonly referred to as the jaws of life. Everything's hooked up on reels, so that whenever we get to a call, we can just pull it straight off mm -hmm. of the reel. The tools are ready to go. Um, that's pretty much everything into this compartment here. Okay. Uh, next one up, we carry uh, an extra ladder, uh, stuff for water rescue, rope rescue, and then also struts that are used to stabilize a car that might be on its roof or on its oh, side. Oh, okay. So we can actually use struts to make the car where it's safe to get in to get to the patient and access okay. the, pa the patient. Um, carry our own drinking water. Um, these are for uh, highway cones. They're actually oh, collapsible. Okay. Anytime we're on the roadway, we have to put cones out in front and or behind the truck. Um, tarps, that way if we come into the house for a fire, we want to cover up everything as much as we can. We want to try to salvage any property that we can. So we bring our own tarps. Um, again, more rescue equipment on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Extension cords for lights. And then this is, these are all hand tools, axes, uh, our forcible entry tools. And then also up on the top of the truck, you can't see, there's also a light tower. So that if it's at nighttime, we also we bring our own light. We have to bring whatever tools we're going to need to work with. We on have to site. we have to bring with us. Now, do, does everyone have the same job all the time? Like, if I were to go to a call, I would be the person who would always bring out the jaws of life or something like that. I want to go back inside for a minute because we're going to show some maps here. How do the how does the job stuff work? It varies from call to call. Uh huh. Um, it's kind of based upon what type of emergency you're responding to, and then that's part of the you know some some. Uh, calls there are certain assignments other ones it's a job of the captain to make sure that anything that has to be done that it's covered okay by his crew <laughs> okay now here I thought this, these are maps of all the residential areas that exist um, in your fire training in your fire district yes and there's also some of uh, mutual aid the other districts that we go to uh -huh. they're also in there um, that way whenever they give us a street address and a map page we can go to that map we know exactly which house it is on that. So when you guys street. get the 911 call, they give you the address, but they also give you a map page number. That is correct. And how has cell phone technology changed the 911 process from you guys since we used to have landlines everywhere? Uh, some of it has helped. Some of it has made it more of a hindrance. Uh, not all of the communication centers have the capability of pinpointing a cellular 911 call. Whereas if you call from your house, you dial 911, your address and everything comes up to the dispatcher. Um, with the cell phone, they actually have to GPS pinpoint that, and not all communication centers have that capability. Uh, so if you call 911 from a cell phone, you need to make sure that you know where you're at, either a common street address, the city, or a street intersection. So you have to kind of know your, your, your area that you're in when you make a cellular 911 call. As I come out of the truck here, we, let's go back to Hector Garcia Middle School, because we're about to get into the firefighter's gear. Hector Garcia, another question for you guys? How, how many times do you go out in one month? No. Okay, so what's it? The, the question deals with like a typical month. How frequently do you guys get calls? Uh, Is there a typical month? Not really. Anything's, that's one thing's interested about being in the fire service and being a firefighter. Um, calls may be down one month, up another month. A lot of it depends upon the weather, the time of year, um, and also your area. The population of your area. There's some areas that are heavy commercial areas where their population may be three times during the day what it is at night. They're going to run more calls during the day, less at night, and then vice versa. So it, it depends upon your area that you're in. There's, there's not really a typical. Okay. We're going to begin to put on the fire gear, and at this point I'd like to invite Scott into the process because as I begin to take off my shoes so I can get into these fabulous boots that they provided me and the, and the uniform, Scott's going to show you the actual speed that firefighters do this in because there's no way, ladies and gentlemen, that I'm obviously going to do it anywhere close as rapidly as Scott. So Scott, you just take it away, right. and hopefully I'll have my shoes off before you're entirely geared up. Well, I got a little bit of advantage here because our, our uh, boots here that we wear, our station boots got zippers in Ah, so, I'll let you, uh, actually Gary, I'll have you hold the microphone for him while he speaks and I'll go ahead and put my, my, sh my shoes on there. So we can just kick off our station boots when we get a call. So oh, notice how quickly he's got the pants on and he's got everything else going. <laughs> He's beginning to move immediately to put on his gear. I have my shoes off now, and um, I'm about to put on the boots and hopefully get them in. Oh, check that out. 
these like stirrup handles make a big difference to go in. And then the pants go up. And this is, oops, I think I'm caught on something already. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Thank you, kind sir. And we're raising up, and we do this. And my suspenders go over. And I'm pulling down. Whoops, I'm hooked. There we go. Ooh, I'm getting a little bit better at that over time. And hopefully my hands aren't too cold to actually get those in. Buckle my buckle. And I'm pulling. Ooh, that's about as tight as I'm going to get in these bigger pants. And now I'm putting, now the purpose of this obviously is to make sure that every part of my skin is covered. Right, Gary? Yes. So I'm going to put this on because this is what event, oops, I better, well, let's see if I can leave my glasses on. Ooh. Very good. And Scott, you'll notice, at this point in time, has his air tank already on, has his uh, jacket already on and everything, and is about to put on the oxygen mask, and his immediately works. I hear the, uh, the air go air on. Mask. Mask. The air mask. Thank you. Rob Odenwald is joining us, the deputy chief from Fenton, and I don't know how many times they've corrected me throughout the course of the day that it is indeed an air mask and an air tank because oxygen is a flammable gas, and we don't want to have that anywhere near the fire environment. And Scott is succeeding very quickly while I'm reaching back to put my jacket on. Uh, feeling better all the time with this. Hoping that I'm actually connected. And then of course here's the, okay, so what happened to my zipper? Ah. Okay. And, oops, I'm not up all the way on quite yet. Okay. All right. And I'm, I'm Velcroed in. I've got gloves over here. Now, let's take a moment just to look at the air tank that they're, they're going to see that's going to go on me. So you guys see what it looks like. And this is what's going to, I'm going to have to turn that on in a minute. That gets up a little bit more. Oops, nope. I'm in the wrong place. There you, there you go. And I want the air tank up on my shoulders so that I'm able to carry the weight a lot better. And then I take these straps here. I lean forward a little bit and pull them down. Pull them back to you like this. Like, this. like that. Oh, oh, I'm going shushing down the slopes now. That makes a big difference. Thank yeah, you, Rob, for that description. That makes it a lot easier. And that's Scott and I'm, that's Scott making a noise because his air tank is working. And at this point, and as you can see, he's all ready to go. And I'm still hopefully going to get Velcroed up here with something around here. And. I'm not connected to something there, Rob. Yeah, you're almost there. Okay. You're almost there. There you go. This is actually faster than this morning. And... Right there. Uh, oh. One on each side. One on each side. Wrong one. Oops, wrong one. There you go. Here. You pull them forward. Oh. Uh, this way. There we go. I pulled for. Oh, I feel a little tighter than I did this morning. That's a good thing. And last but now... We've got the mask on. And students, why don't you begin? Do you guys have some questions before I begin to put this on and you, I become more muffled? Do you guys have some questions right now about the uniform for myself or Rob or Scott? Go ahead. How many firemen are there at the station? Oh, Rob, how many firemen generally work in a station in a house? Uh, anywhere from three to five or more, depending on how many uh, pieces of equipment are housed there. Uh, where I work, there's five. Three people ride on the fire apparatus and two people ride on the ambulance. And do you guys do shifts, like the, I guess the traditional shift that you're on so long and then uh, off so long? 24-hour shift, three separate platoons, A, B, and C. Crew. Okay. Now I'll ask you a question. I should take my glasses off before I put yes. on the oxygen mask yes. for yes. sure? Yes. Air mask. Thank you. The air mask for sure. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> you know these guys know their job because every moment in time I slip up on that, they manage to say it quite correctly. To make a point, though, the yeah. firefighters that do wear glasses like yourself, uh -huh. they make a special insert and they have to go out and buy special glasses that lock in there. Oh, really? So that they can see through there. Oh, they wow. wear their glasses. That's very cool. Another question, Garcia Middle, go right ahead. <laughs> Slide your hood off first. Oh. How much does that weigh? How much does this weigh? How, about how much weight do I have? How much weight does this go? Uh, does your, this With all your gear, including your turnout gear, 
we're looking at about 60 to 65 pounds between okay. the tank. The tank's somewhere 25 to 30 pounds, and you're probably talking about 30 pounds of gear. Okay. Now I've pulled back the cap. I should say Gary reminded me, and he pulled the cap back for me. So put the oxygen mask on. Air. Air mask on. You'd think that eventually Tim would remember that. Put the air <laughs> mask on, tight against my face, and I've got some straps. Wait a minute. Do the bottom ones first. Do the bottom ones first. I've Make sure this is all the way down behind the back of your head. There you okay. go. And of course, for me, it's always a matter of figuring out yeah. where the strap is located. There you go. I'll take the hand out back, I'm being told, where the strap is located. And, and then, hold that for me while I think, sir. And then, have I got them on? Is this the right? Just pull it back. Just pull it back. Oh, that's about as tight as it's going to go. Okay. And now I've got the mask on. Another question from Hector Garcia. Go right ahead. How do you get air into the tank? Yes. I think the question is, how does the air come in? That's exactly what we're going to show you in just a minute. But first, I guess, I'm going to put on my hood up over first. Oh. How does, it, how does air get into the tank, Gary? Uh, that's what we fill in the back. There's a, uh, a spot that comes loose on the, uh, from the, your backpack, uh -huh. and that's where we hook the hose up that we showed them a while ago from the truck. We actually hook a hose into here, turn the valve on, and then it fills the tank full of air. Okay. And I think I'm good to go. They're looking at me and making sure that... And I realize that my voice is probably a bit muffled on okay. this microphone. I'm coming to the other microphone. And... Uh, now it's time to put on the helmet. Thank you, gentlemen. The helmet goes on. And, a, and an email question we got, guys, was, um, are, these, are these helmets made of similar stuff like a, a race car driver would use, like a NASCAR helmet? Is it that kind of thing or different? I don't believe so. This is basically a fiberglass and plastic composite. There's even some leather ones that are out there. Okay. But I believe they're designed differently to take impact. Okay. And I know it's a little bit warmer. I'm adjusting differently because I'm not fucking up the way I did this morning. So now I guess the last thing to do is to put on my mouthpiece, which we'll do when we get out there. Or are we going to do that here? Uh, we can do that out okay, there. Okay, we'll do that out there. So I believe it's time to actually go into the fire truck. We're going to head out because we're going to go to the unit now. And uh, I'm going to move out to the fire truck this year. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. I'm going to move out to the, the fire truck that's out here that's going to take me to the tower that they use to obviously practice, and we're going to go to a smoke-filled room where you guys are going to have the chance to see thermal imaging technology at work. And so as I get into the fire truck here and begin to head down with the folks from Eureka, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Phil Goody. I'm going to turn it over to Phil Goody, who's going to explain to you. He's the assistant chief in Fenton, and he's going to explain to you. Thanks very much, sir. He's going to explain to you guys um, how the thermal imaging technology works. Take it away, Phil. All right, what we're going to do today is when Tim's in a fire truck on his way down here, is we're going to put him in a, a, a burn tower. We have it smoked up for him today. We're going to show him our thermal imaging camera. Our thermal imaging camera, what it does is kind of looks through the smoke, lets us see if there's anybody in there, pets or human beings, and that way we can find them and bring them out of a burning building. The camera is actually designed to come off your body heat, the energy your body excerpts from inside of a burning building. You can determine on whether that is from cold and uh, heat. So what we want to do is we're going to use that camera and basically it can look through the smoke and can help us get around the house too, kind of go around the building. So we're going to show that to Tim when he pulls up. Once he gets here, we'll pull him on and we'll, and we'll do that. Also what we could do with our thermal imaging camera is we can actually check if, uh, especially in the cold weather that we're having recently here in, in St. Louis, Missouri, is uh, if somebody's outside, we can check with that thermal imaging and, and actually see their body temperature from the snow. So as Tim's pulling up here, we're going to go ahead and let him get out of the truck. We're going to help him uh, get his tank on, get his mask on, and we're going to put him in. See what, see Tim's ready to go inside this burning build, this, this smoke filled building. All right, Tim, you ready to go? I think I'm definitely good to go. It's a little bit like, I guess, like an astronaut would feel with all this gear on, I guess. So I'll let you, somewhere at my oxygen tank here's here. I'll let you get suited up and then we'll put my oxygen, my air tank, my air tank, my air tank, my air tank, with, connected to my air mask, because we're going to go into a room which will have smoke and you guys will see what that's like. He, of course, is making sure that his is all hooked up and ready to go. And then he turns himself on to make all that happen.
and he suits up. And as he does that, I'm going to put my gloves on because obviously we want all the skin covered. Okay, we're going to go inside and to the left, and Phil, I'll have you make sure I'm connected right here with the tank. Is the tank on? Okay. I'm not turned on yet, no. Which I have to, I have to reach back and find it, and so thank you, Phil, for taking care of that. Ready? I'm ready. Flashlight off, we're in a totally dark environment, and we're going to. Okay, what happened to my oxygen tank? You're fine, you're fine. I'm fine, okay, good. It just is making a different yeah, sound than it was before. And now we're about to see the thermal, you guys are able to see the thermal imaging look. And I'm. Got it? I've got it. I'm able to hold the camera and let you guys see Phil right there. Now, and you can see the difference, obviously, of the dark and the light. The lighter colors, the white colors, is the energy coming off of him because he's the warmer figure in the room, turning out more energy. So this a black environment that you're seeing here, and it's this that you would be able to see to find a body in this room or to see the different objects in the room as you go about finding the fire. You notice in this instance, he's laying down on the floor, so I'd be able to see him like that, able to clearly see the outline of his body as I move the, uh, the fire, the camera, pardon me, along the way. It looks like for some reason his feet are a little bit warmer than other parts of his body. And then we go back up again. So this is the way the technology works in what is indeed an entirely smoke-filled and dark room. Phil, let's head on back outside. All right, ready to go. I'm ready to go. You want to take the camera? I've got the camera. I'll take the camera. I'm walking along the wall, going back to where Phil's going to open the door and we're walking back outside again and there's a little bit of a step and we are back out and good to go so that's what it looks like inside with the thermal through the thermal imaging camera and I'll let Phil get myself detangled here for a minute and let Phil get all unlocked before then we make sure that we take me off right <laughs> and all that kind of good stuff. So, to turn it off, Phil, I'll let you finish. To turn it off, then, what do we do? And we just pull it, turn it, twist, pull it out, and now I'm good to go again. Phil, thanks very much for that demonstration. I'll turn the microphone back to you for a little bit more information for the students while I head back. All right, one of the reasons why we do our training is because of technology. Uh, technology changes over time, so what we need to do is train our guys on how to use the thermal imaging camera. So that's why we do this type of training. We try and do it anytime we get a new piece of equipment, so that way we can show them and get used to it whenever uh, they'd rather do it in training, learn about it before we have to use it on a real scene. So hopefully Tim learned a little bit. 
So we've got, so there you have that example of how the thermal imaging technology works. So you're able to see from inside the smoke-filled environment. Pick it up here. Move this way over the camera cable. And come back in and say hi to Gary again and our good friends here. So Gary, I'll let us start by you just unstrapping my helmet, I guess, to be on the safe side to begin with. To make sure I'm disconnecting properly. And the helmet comes off. And then this part of my... Oops. You don't want to... Oops. Well, we'll the I should loosen my straps first. I have to remember that. And the reason you're hearing that sound, that wee sound, is because... Gary, let the kids understand why we hear that wee sound every once in a while. What that is, we call it our, uh, our pass device. Um, whenever you stop movement, it'll, this senses that you haven't moved in a while, and after 20 seconds, it'll start going off to saying that you better move or somebody's going to come to find you. Then it'll go on what we call a full alarm. And once it goes into full alarm, the only way to shut it off is to hit the button here, and it'll continually go off louder and louder and louder until somebody finds the pack and shuts it off. That way, if something happens to you and you go down, we, can, we know where to go to find you. We can listen for the noise, take us right to you. So let's go to Hector Garcia Middle School. Guys, you've seen quite a bit happen there. What questions do you have about what you just saw? Is the worst time during the summer for fires? Oh, Gary, is it, is it more difficult to fight fires during the summertime in the heat or the winter, or is there a significant difference? Uh, there's not really a difference. Each of them have their own unique challenges. Uh, the wintertime, we're dealing with the ice, extreme cold. Um, the summertime you're dealing with once you put your gear on and extreme heat and temperatures. Uh, both of them you have to make sure that you're prepared for in the morning when you come to work. It's winter, wearing warm clothes. Summertime, making sure you're drinking plenty of fluids, keeping yourself acclimated to the temperatures. Uh, I put my glasses on and oops, that's the tank that's just giving its little emergency sound. Hector Garcia, another question for you and then we're going to go inside and we're going to learn more about thermal imaging technology. We have the how, how, how much is the thermal imaging camera? Well, that's a perfect transition question as we go in to meet Rob Odenwald again to talk about thermal imaging technology. The question, Rob, was, so how much does a camera like that cost? Which, uh, the camera that, that was out there? Uh-huh. I believe when that one was purchased, it was about $15,000. Now, believe it or not, they've come down. The first camera we ever purchased was $25,000, and now they cost about eight. Let's, let's let the students have a basic understanding of how thermal imaging technology works. What they were seeing on that image, like the lighter colors, where we were able to see um, Phil's like, you know, whiter feet, that kind of thing, is because he's giving off more energy there? You're seeing energy. You're, you're not really seeing images. You're interpreting images, but you're seeing energy. Everything puts off energy. So uh, it, it, what's ever putting off the most energy, and we're translating that as heat, is going to be whiter. Okay. And that's in the surrounding environment. So whatever hotter is going to be whiter and the cooler stuff is going to be grayish or dark or even black. So that's different from like night vision goggles or looking things Correct. through what's called night vision. Let the students understand right. that distinction. Night vision is actually a camera that uses existing light to enhance what you're seeing. There has to be light. There is no light. We don't need light for uh, thermal imaging cameras. We need energy. Okay. So the the... You're using infrared technology? You're reading infrared waves is what we're reading. Okay, so infrared waves is a certain type of wave that's on the color spectrum, the wavelength, the Correct. light spectrum. Correct. Anything that gives off energy, and everything gives off energy, it gives off some sort of infrared waves. And, and because, of, because the t that camera is designed to see the infrared wa waves in a way that a regular camera would not. Correct. Now, and... and the cameras are actually getting smaller now than the one we use, correct? Yes, you can buy them uh, very small. We have a small one here. Uh, the one you saw was uh, just a little bit bigger than what the most of the cameras we have out there. That camera is about 10 years old, and we bought one that's about half that size. Uh, but now you actually have this one, which they call a personal thermal imager by Bullard. That uh, you asked about price. This uh -huh. was like five thousand dollars. So they've come down. It doesn't have all the features that the other camera does, but this is uh, the newest and smallest style you'll see. Okay, and we've actually got an image that shows the students the different uh, cameras through the years, so to speak. And right. Uh, right now, what I'm looking at obviously is the lights look much whider, and because uh, right. they're obviously giving off more energy. Hector Garcia Middle School, you guys have questions? Go right ahead and ask. <laughs> will, will that camera find a pet? 
In a house? In a house. Well, will the camera find a pet? Yes. It'll find anything that puts off heat. And yes, it will find a pet. Yes, they've been used to find dogs and cats. We've actually made successful rescues over the years for dogs and cats. Well, that's a good thing to know. Yeah, that's right. You do get cats in trees? You ever seen a cat skeleton in a tree? No. Because they come down when they're hungry. <laughs> Dr. Garcia, another question from you guys? Uh, I'm trying to keep everybody's excited about it. I'm trying to keep them all down. That's very cool. That's very cool. So now, what kind of training do your firefighters go through to understand the images they're seeing on the screen? Well, that's what it, that's what we've been doing. Uh, it's not a basic class. You, know, you go to the academy, you learn to fight fire. This is something a little more advanced, and it's as technology has changed. So a lot of the training happens when you go out and purchase one. Originally, we purchased these with the idea of doing search and rescue, but we're finding when we use them so much, so much we can use them for so much more. Mm. And that's what you happen to catch us on is putting a get together a formal class to get people to understand how to use them and interpret what they're seeing. Now, I had a chance to talk with Gary at the start of the show about how he got into firefighting. Rob, what got you into the world of firefighting? Well, I got pretty lucky a few years ago when I was a younger guy. I wasn't a firefighter. Uh, I wasn't somebody that grew up wanting to be a firefighter. Uh, the opportunity arose. Uh, my father approached me about being one, believe it or not, because I needed a good steady job. And I said, no, nah, I really wasn't interested until he said, well, you know, they work a 10-day a month schedule. You can still work on cars on your side. And I said, well, I'll give it a shot. So here I am. <laughs> and and that's how the, it started. We had, the, uh, we had the chance to talk at lunch. And could you give the students a little bit of information about Dalmatians <laughs> in the world of, world of the fire department? <laughs> sure. Uh, Dalmatians were also called coach dogs, and they have a natural affection with horses. And that's how it all started, is Dalmatians, when fire pumpers years ago were pulled by horses before motorized vehicles, the Dalmatians were used to get them started. They would nip at the horse's feet to get them moving. They would also run out in front of the apparatus to get people out of the way. So essentially, they were also the first sirens. Now, you're a deputy chief. Yes. And... Um does that mean you're in charge of like a, a group of, of fire stations, or do you have administrative tasks? How does it organize it from that perspective in a fire department? Yes. But all of the above? <laughs> That's what I like the answer yes. for. Yes, I, I'm in charge of training, so that is my administrative responsibility. But also, uh, we, where I work, we run what's called a duty week. So one week out of the month, I'm restricted to the district where I oversee any calls that would come in. I want to bring Phil in. Phil, come in and join us again. Once again, thank you so much no for taking me through the smoke-filled room. I really appreciate it. Let the students have a sense of what you got, what got you into firefighting. Uh, I've been doing it since I was 13 years old. Oh, really? That young? Yes, sir. And how did that get started? Uh, actually, I wanted to do it ever since I was, you know, since I was little. And uh, nobody in my family ever wanted to do it. I don't know. I just like the, f the excitement, the adrenaline, the lights and the sirens. I wanted to help people. And I got into this. I knew I wasn't you know, want to sit behind a desk, so I wanted to go out and help the people. So... I uh, started out in the Explore program as a young kid, and as I came up through the ranks, I went to a uh, junior. When I was a junior in high school, I went to a tech school that specialized in uh, firefighting. Got involved with the fire department at that age, and I've been here ever since. been here 21 years. Now, you obviously understand quite effectively how to use that camera. How often do you guys train on that kind of thing? We try and train on it at least twice a year, once in the spring, once in the fall, and just to get the new guys that come in a sense of how to use our equipment properly, and we want to do that during training versus on the real scene. So that way they're comfortable with it. In terms of training, are there like state mandates, federal laws that mandate a fire fire has to have so many hours of training on different kinds of things? How does that work? NFPA, which is the National Fire Protection Association, which uh, does, sets the standards for firefighting and the amount of training that we need every year. So we have to abide by those rules. That way we, uh, we don't get fined, basically. Okay. <laughs> don't get in trouble. It's kind of uh, like school going to school. We have to have schooling all throughout the year. Hector Garcia, another question from you guys? Yes. Uh, has any of the two captains there or anybody at the station, have they been injured on the job? Like a boy and a girl. All right. Okay, Phil, I'll let you speak to that first. Actually, yes, I have. I've, I've actually been injured twice. 
Uh, my first fire actually went inside of a burning building and the, and the ceiling kind of came down on top of me, the drywall. Uh, wasn't injured, wasn't severely injured in things, but I went to the hospital and got checked out. And the second one, it was during a training incident and actually uh, my regulator came off and I sucked in some smoke and I was taken to the hospital for observation. But mm. um, on this kind of job, I mean, out there, uh, our injuries, as the fire goes on, it increases our risk of getting injured and um, we just, uh, hopefully those injuries are, are minor compared to the ultimate sacrifices is dying on the scene. Another question, Hector Garcia? Like, do they have an accident? What, hap what happens when they have an accident and they call in? How, okay, how, what's how, the pro how, how soon do you have to be there? Okay, so let's just go through the process. Let's assume I have a fire in my house, I'm calling 911. How does it all happen? How quickly can you get on site? Uh, first of all, when an incident takes place, is you, once you get out of your house, if your house gets on fire, if it's an emergency, you want to go somewhere else, a uh, neighbor's house, and then when you call 911, you want to tell them where the emergency is at, not where you're calling from. Because if you're in a neighbor's house and we get called there, obviously we show up in the fire truck in the house that's next door. So basically, when you call 911, they take the call, then they give it to us, and we should be at your house between five to seven minutes, national average. Let's hear from some more firefighters. Gentlemen, come right on in. Don, thanks so much for being here. Thanks, sir. Uh, Assistant Chief Don Tomnitz, am I pronouncing that correctly? And you're with Eureka? I am, yes. And how did you get involved in the world of firefighting? I had something, a childhood dream of mine. Uh, I always wanted to do it as a, as a young man. Um, actually, going through high school, my parents would let me. We had volunteers, and I lived in Pacific, and uh, they wouldn't let me do it because of some sports I was in at the time. So as soon as I got out, I went to college and uh, came back from college and realized this firefighting is what I wanted to do. And as soon as I got back, I joined Pacific Fire District as a volunteer for them and stayed with them and then moved to Eureka and uh, worked my way up to the assistant chief position. Now, we're obviously dealing with an audience that's both young people as well as, you know, general adult audience watching on television. What are some things that you would want them to know about fire, you know, preparing their home for a fire emergency or the, you know, a fire route out of their residence, that kind of thing. What are the things that people should be thinking about to make sure they're ready in case something happens? Well, a lot of the things that we do in the schools is go in and do the, uh, um, Edith, you know, the exit dealer in the home, exit drill in the home, is, is actually practice that. You know, doing one at school is great, but you need to bring it home to your parents, show it with your parents, and actually practice it more than just once a year. You need to do it several times a year, so you do know what to do and where to go in the case of an emergency. Hector Garcia, another question for you, and then I'm going to invite one of our other firefighters in. Hector Garcia, take it away. What, it, what is a two alarm or a three alarm fire? Oh, okay. We'll start with that question. First of all, I'll let you introduce yourself to the audience. Hey, my name is Joseph Sanchez. And Joseph, what is the difference between like a one alarm, two alarm, three alarm, four alarm fire? It's just uh, the difference on how many trucks show up and all that. And a one alarm doesn't mean just only one truck shows up. It shows they have pre plans on what's uh, coming in. It could be two pumpers, one ladder truck, and an ambulance. And if you arrive and see something going on and you need more trucks, you can bump it up to the second alarm and if it's still going and you need more you just bump it up to the third alarm to get more trucks out to you so you everybody can stay safe and work safely and what got you into firefighting uh i wanted to do it a long time ago and i kind of just held off and pursued other pursuits and went other ways and i'm just now coming back in the last four years and i started and kind of got it and liked it and then started in the ems process of it and the paramedics and all that and then just really enjoyed it and started getting more involved in it. So you do paramedic work as well? Yes, almost everybody in the St. Louis County area is a paramedic now. And, and for, from that perspective as a paramedic, what are the kinds of things a paramedic might be doing on site, so to speak, that a firefighter wouldn't be doing? Uh, a paramedic would be assisting more in the patient care and on, uh, uh, you know, just everything. Really, in St. Louis County, everybody is usually a firefighter paramedic, so you can do both and range from a sick case to a f house fire. And if, in case there is someone in the house and you get them out, you are able to transport them or help other firefighters that are injured. On it's cold today. If we were to like have a, if we were to spray the fire hose today, this is a question you guys. I just want to ask it. <laughs> if we spray the fire hose today on the burning fire, I mean, how fast are we going? Are you guys going to have to deal with ice from the fact you're spraying the house down or the building down, just the, from what you're spraying out? The spray isn't going to turn into ice right away. It's going to be the runoff that comes out of the building and all that is where the ice is going to become a problem out by around the trucks and like on the grounds and all that. So as far as in the fire and close to it, you'll be all right. But it's away from it that you have to be more careful. 
I really want to thank you for being with us, Joe. Thanks so thank much. Thank you. And Gary and everybody, thank you guys for Rob, Don, everybody, Scott, for putting on the uniform way faster, obviously, than I put the uniform on. Thank you all very much for joining us today. Thank you, Phil, for being out there, my man in the smoke environment. Uh, it's the Eureka Fire Training Center here from the Tri-County Consortium and in Pacific, Missouri. If you want to learn more about this particular firefighting district, then their website is actually up and available, and you can see that. This program will be archived and available for on-demand viewing at any time on our HECTV.org website and also on our HECTV live panes on iTunes U. And then, of course, you can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter and every other social media site that exists out there. We're going to be taking a break, and we'll come back to you with HECTV Live in January for the final program in our Giver series on January 5th. Bye, everybody from Eureka.